Okay. <laughs> Can you guys hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, yes, my name is Sierra Ward. I'm a student at the illustrious Western Michigan University, um, enjoying my time there. Um, yes, as she said, I'm a marketing major, so I'm really passionate about that. Um, today, I'm here to share a unique piece of art that I've created. Writing is a very intimate form of art, and at a young age, I found a safe space in poetry. With so many changes and gray areas in our world, sometimes poetry is the one thing that makes sense to me. Much content is inspired by the books in the Holy Bible, some of my favorites, Proverbs and Psalms in specific, um, with writing that is so eloquent. My hope is that my words will resonate with you and that you too will find that same sp safe space. Maybe a new idea will be sparked or a new dream will be revealed. Or maybe you will simply be reminded of the unique beauty that you bring to every table. Whatever it may be, keep your ears open to this handcrafted essence. This poem I will be sharing is titled, To Dream Like Martin. <clears throat> if my fingers were the rhythm, if my sound was the blues, if we were different, given different songs to sing, would you choose to sing something new? Music that rang from ancestors' cries, this movement played for far too long. The sounds of freedom, oh, sweet, sweet freedom. Will we ever truly hear its song? See, if I was told to dream like Martin, what phrase would I be destined to say? To speak and know your voice is heard, only one can desire to proclaim. I have a dream, said MLK. That message still remains the same. To see children of all colors standing together evokes an everlasting change. While shadowing behind our ancestors, his message was made to heal. Nonviolence is a powerful weapon. Your voice is in fact what they cannot steal. Fighting to keep this hope alive, fighting to fuel this drive. You can put me down, you can count me out, but yet I still will rise. The change that you are wanting to see must first come from the inside. The children are watching your every move, their passion we must ignite. Darkness is used to distract the eye. Instead, they must rely upon our light. Dream big, I say dream big. With love, we all will unite. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sierra. That was inspiring as always, and uh, thank you again. Okay, so I'd like to um, introduce the two um, organizations, leaders, and CEOs that we're honoring today. Um, first, it's Dr. Valerie Cunningham, who's the CEO and founder of Synergy Health Center, and that's a healthcare organization dedicated to transforming lives for generations and empowering people for a lifetime. She believes that the, they believe that the mental and behavioral health services that are provided for those individuals and families give them the tools they need to have a better quality of life. Her staff at Synergy Health Center are intentional in their care of all individuals with a holistic and spiritually, a specialty in culturally diverse services. Um, they're dedicated to care that's sustaining and improves the mental health and substance abuse recovery of individuals and families. The Synergy Health Center is committed to delivering this care with compassion, personalized care to all, and most of all, all of those in need. Valerie has her, Dr. Cunningham has her master's degree in social work from the Western Michigan University, her undergraduate degree in business administration from Western Michigan University. She has over 18 years of experience in the behavioral health field. And her desire is to see change and transformation as her driving force to, ha to actually have created the Synergy Health Center. She does provide this culturally sensitive and relevant programming 
within communities and for families that may otherwise have uh, difficulty reaching and having this kind of services. services. Her love and compassion shows through in all of the work that she does. And every year, Valerie um, puts on a conference that was new to Kalamazoo on stigma and mental health and mental health in the black community. I think this is the third year of, you know, will be the third year for that program. Um, and it really has been something that has transformed the education and health providers and all of us with healthcare and mental and behavioral health. The second um, group that we're honoring today are Men of Purpose. And the two co-founders for Men of Purpose, Will Atkinson and Anthony Spencer. So Will Atkinson is the executive director who's a Michigan native who was born in Benton Harbor and raised in Kalamazoo. He's an accomplished life coach whose greatest joy comes from seeing others overcome barriers. Anthony Spencer, his co-founder and treasurer education director for the um, program, has served 18 years as a youth development supervisor with the YMCA before they co-founded Men of Purpose. They are protectors of families and providers. Their lessons are role models, and they are role models for um, successful business ownership, group economics, and cooperative community spirit. They seek to produce young men who add value to, to and can, can take ownership of their community. So we at WMED are honored to honor these individuals today for the work that they do and that they have committed their time to do that is in the legacy of Martin Luther King. So thank you. Next. So next on the agenda then is uh, Dr. Cunningham. Oh, there you are. I'm technically challenged sometimes. Good afternoon, everyone. I am again Valerie Cunningham, and I am so excited to be here. And I'm honored to be um, presented such an honor by Dr. Dixon and the, the team here at WMed. It is it is definitely an honor for me. And if I say things like, let the church say amen, just go along with me because I wear multiple roles. So you may hear amen sometimes. And so uh, along with being the founder and the CEO of the Synergy Health Center, I also pastor the Empowerment Center uh, alongside my husband for the last 20, almost 26 years. And so, you know, it's just intrinsically in me to sometimes when I'm finishing to say that. So I'll, tr I'll do my, I'll try to have my, my business hat on so that I, I stay in business mode. But thank you again for being here today. I started the Synergy Health Center almost 20 years ago this year. And I started the Synergy Health Center because I felt that there were gaps in services provided to African Americans specifically. 20 years ago, nobody was really talking about uh, mental health for black people and specifically for them. And I always wanted to be politically correct 20 years ago, so I said we provided culturally sensitive services. Probably in 2018, I met with someone, they said, what in the world is that? <laughs> and it takes someone that is not in the mental health norm to say to you what you've been saying this whole time, does anybody really understand what that means? And so in 2018, we looked back at our, our mission and we revised it, just we tweaked it just a little bit. And so that's what you're getting today is our tweaked, revised version. So this is a heartbeat of the Synergy Health Center. The heartbeat of the Synergy Health Center is to transform lives through mental health, substance abuse, and support services with a specific emphasis on African Americans. I've often been told by people, it's not politically correct to say that you're focusing on black people or African Americans. And I said, well, why not? 
And I feel like we're just in a time and an age that we should be able to say what needs to be said without having to walk on eggshells, not to make other people feel uncomfortable because of the work that we do. So I decided that I would take that stance and be unpolitically correct by saying we are focusing on people that need us and they need to know that, that we're available. And so our heartbeat in this community is not people, and I've had people say, well, you're being exclusive. No, I am being all inclusive. And what I am doing is I am meeting the needs of a community that needs it most, and I'm educating everybody else. So guess what? I am all inclusive. And so that's the heartbeat of the Synergy Health Center. What we do. And I hear often, nobody knows who you are, nobody knows what you do. I'm like, I don't know how to do it any better. So this is what we do. We close gaps in inappropriate mental health care. That's our mission. Uh, that's a part of what we do. We increase access to mental health and substance abuse services, and we want to eradicate the stigma around mental health in the African American community. So if you wanted to sum it up, that's what we do. We were intentional about our mission, so in 2014, we purchased a facility on the north side of Kalamazoo. It is located on North and Harrison Street. So if you used to go to McKenzie's Bakery and get you some, um, you know, baked goods in the morning, or if you was over there trying to get some checkers, uh, fast food, we are right on the corner of um, Norrison um, and North Street across from the EMS. We felt that we needed to be strategically located within the community to eliminate, eliminate barriers and close gaps into service. So we feel like the highest concentration of African Americans or black people is on the north side of Kalamazoo. And so why not put the services where the people need it most and to eliminate any barriers and access they need to services. So this is what we do. Who do we serve? Um, in 2020, we served over 260 clients. 90% of our clients are Medicaid recipients. 90%. So as a nonprofit organization, imagine trying to meet a budget with 90% of your recipients being Medicaid recipients. The ones that need the most, need the services the most, often have the greatest challenges in finding places that will receive their, their insurance. And so it's very difficult for them to continue to overcome barriers when every turn they have, there is a barrier in place. So we've decided that as our organization that we're willing to take the hit in those areas, but we also know that we need community support to continue to do the work that we're doing. 45% of the clients that we serve are African-American clients. And our clients range anywhere from five years old to unlimited um, older generation in their 60s or 70s. So we cover the whole gamut in the population that we serve. We don't turn away anyone. Everyone is welcome to be served. We are intentional that the therapists that are serving our community mirror the community that we're serving. So we are intentional about hiring diverse people, especially having black therapists. And right now someone asked me, I think, during a conversation in this room, what does your staff look like? I said, well, right now it's 90% African American. And so when our people, whoever we're serving, they walk in the door, they can see somebody that looks like them, and they're not seeing them in a role that, they're seeing them in a professional role. Um, and oftentimes in therapy, clients say things like, I have to, if, if it's a, and this is no slight, so hear what I'm saying, that when black children or black people go in and they're often encountering, encountering white therapists, they feel like they have to explain the culture before they can get help. And that's always discouraging to them to have to explain who I am, to, exp to explain the language, to, have to um, say, you know, if I said my mama whooped me, oh my gosh, you were abused, let me write that down and report it. Well, no, no, no. I got whoopings too. Pray I was going to say praise the Lord. <laughs> see, there, see, 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 my church person came out of me just for a moment. Um, so those are like cultural things. You know, I teach at Western. I'm an adjunct instructor at Western. I haven't taught in a while. But I taught... Um, first level, social, uh, first year social workers about this. And we had these conversations about language and culture. And when you say um, whooping, what does that mean? And there's like a beating. And I mean, so we, 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 we really got into a whole bunch of dynamics about culture and understanding culture. So I think it's really important 
that when you're uh, providing a service that you can represent the cultures that you're serving. And 23% this past year, we served 63 children and adolescents in our agency. Um, our goal is to continue to increase the number of youth and adolescents we serve. Why? Because if we can reach this generation, we can change the next generation. It takes us just reaching one child that will impact a whole generation. And we're all about generational impact. So we're intentional about going after our youth. So how do we do it? We are caring, we connect with community, and these are just some of the mental health um, connections that we have in the community. We're in elementary and middle schools. So before COVID hit, we were getting ready to, to be in three of the elementary schools here in Kalamazoo. We were in Northeastern Elementary School providing services for three years. We would serve over 32 to 35 kids in elementary um, throughout the school year. And I can tell you those kids needed our services. We were going to get, uh, we're, we're getting ready to launch into Woodward and one other one before COVID hit and which um, put a stop to all of those. We are now in Tree of Life Elementary School. We've been there for the past two years providing face-to-face -face services with those youth that need it. And we are um, working with Millwood Middle School, and we are hoping to provide some pilot services to Millwood Middle School. So we'll talk a little bit more about that when I get to another slide. But we've partnered with Goodwill's Lifelines. We've partnered with Urban Alliance. We've partnered with the Calumet Def Defender's Office, and we take private and public um, insurances. So we believe that it is so important to uh, close gaps, break barriers, and eradicate stigma in the black community. And stigma in the black community says this, I'm weak if I go to see a therapist. I don't have enough faith in God if I go see a therapist. Um, I'm strong, I just need to pull myself up by the bootstraps and everything will be okay. That's the stigma and the shame attached to uh, mental health in the black community that if I get help, that I'm considered a weak person. So I am coming to tear down every false idea that getting mental health services is a shameful act in the black community. How do we do it? Um, this is a, a continuation on of, we create safe places and safe spaces for our youth. So also along with our mental health programming and our substance abuse programming, we offer um, youth and adolescent programming. And that's our family arm is done through the urban zone. I remember asking someone, what do you think the urban zone means? They said, I think it means um, a, a group for black kids. I said, well, yeah, you, you kind of got it right. If that's what you're thinking about urban zone, it really is geared toward at risk underserved youth in our community. Um, we, we have nice terms that we use to refer to, to black people. We say undeserved, underprivileged, at risk. You know, it's all cold. I say it's all cold words to refer to um, the black and brown community. So y'all just have to overlook me. I just putting it out there. I'm like, in my 50s, I feel like I can say whatever. <laughs> so um, what you see up here is actually, these are pictures from our youth program. So we have developed the Be Brave program, which is a girls program that's really geared towards trauma and dealing with them, helping to build their confidence. We have Career Academic Success Team, which is our CAS program, which we've partnered with KVCC, and they've come in and did some partnerships. It's all about career pathing, helping to introduce to our young people career paths, um, career opportunities, be it educational. Every, every student is not going to go to college. What are some other career paths that they can in, uh, go into and still have sustainable income that can provide for families in the future? We just developed uh, the Mind Health Ambassadors Program, which is a two-year program that's actually being funded by the Stryker Foundation. And that is a program that we've recruited. Um, this year, we've recruited over 20 young people. Last year, we had cohorts. It was 18. Uh, the focus was on black and brown students, but we're inclusive of all students. So we had students from all races and ethnic backgrounds participate in our Mind Health Ambassadors Program. We give them an incentive. We incentivize all of our programs. Why are we incentivizing our programs? Because these students either are taking time away from having a job, 
babysitting their siblings, um, having family obligations, so we want to incentivize them. In our Mind Health Ambassadors Program, we teach them about mental health, and we teach them about mindfulness. And if we can reach this generation of adolescents and help them understand mental health and mindfulness before they get it into adulthood, then we feel like we can save generations again. And so over here, I like to do yoga. And yoga is a practice for me. And I've been doing it for, I don't know, six or seven years because of health issues. And I do hot yoga. So anybody been to hot yoga before? where they turn up the heat about 105 degrees and you start doing all this movement, um, is great for releasing stress and toxins out of your body. And so we took our kids. So they go and they have that experience. So this is them having that experience. And you can imagine some of them have never done those things before, but we, we build them up to it. So these are ways that we bring mindfulness practices into mental health. So we're looking at things from a holistic standpoint. And we're introducing, guess what? We're introducing black kids to yoga. How many black people do you know go to yoga? Right? So we're, we're breaking stereotypes and breaking those things that say these are healthy things and places for us. So we are creating safe spaces and safe spaces for them. Our goal this year is to actually implement our alternative, um, our urban zone alternative academic site. This is a pilot with Millwood Middle School because guess what? We want to see our kids succeed. And if they're constantly getting expelled from school and they're not in school or they're not paying attention in school, how can we help them? So we want to be a safe space for them to come to and get reconnected um, to themselves and see the importance of education. Community impact. I think it's really important these last two or three years of my leading the Synergy Health Center, especially since 2019. 2018 was a really hard year for us as an organization. And I was thinking, should I just shut it all down? That was my go-to often. Oh my God, I don't know how things are going to do. I'm going to shut the whole thing down. That, that was my go-to. But in 2018, I had a different thought. I was thinking, what is going to make us stand out above all other organizations versus quitting? What are we doing that other organizations in this community are not doing? And that that was we're providing services with a specific emphasis on African-Americans. No one is doing that. No organization's staff represents the community that we're trying to reach. OK, we're doing something different. So I said to my mentor, I want to do an event. I want to do a symposium. And I want to do it on breaking the stigma of African-American mental health. And she said, Valerie, absolutely not. You don't have time for doing that. You're doing all this other stuff. I said, no, this is what I want to do. And she said, well, if you're not going to listen to me, then let me give you some help. And so all I needed was a little help. We launched our inaugural uh, Breaking the Stigma in 2019 at Mount Zion Baptist Church. And we did it at Mount Zion Baptist Church because we wanted to do it in the community. We wanted to eliminate any barriers to access for the people that we were serving. And we wanted to bring community into the north side and what would be considered a safe space for the people that we serve. So we had over 250 people show up at our first event. It was an experience. It was, uh, it was great. We partnered with ISK at that time to provide CEUs. Uh, we've done this event now. It'll be year four that we did last year. And we partnered with Western Michigan University, and they helped us host it, the um, College of Health and Human Services, for the last three years. And we look to continue to do it um, in different ways to impact our community. We also launched a Let's Talk black mental health as a result of that. The Let's Talk Black Mental Health is a monthly forum where we invite different speakers to come in and really talk about the areas of stigma in the black community. And what you see up here is says The Psychology of Racism by Dr. Andre Fields. Dr. Andre Fields actually came and presented at our Let's Talk Black Mental Health. And he talked about the psychology of um, racism, especially as it relates to the black male. And so these are different uh, events that we do to have community impact. We don't want the conversation to die because sometimes um, things like George Floyd or uh, all of the other events that have taken place, people after it's over in a few years, people forget that it ever happened and they go back to the norm. Well, I don't want you to go back to the norm. I want this always to be, look, in everybody's face in a nice way that we're working together to break the stigma and break barriers in, in black mental health. In 2021, where am I on time? I'm just talking. Uh, somebody please uh, tell me when I've talked too long. I'm almost done, but uh, keep me on track. 
Um, in 2021, the, and, and I want to say this, once I named specifically what we were doing as an organization, that our focus really was on black mental health. Um, I got uh, some connections from the Michigan Health Endowment Fund that said, we want somebody within the Kalamazoo community to take the lead on discovering racial disparities and behavioral health follow-up care um, after an emergency room visit when it comes to African Americans. So this was a specific um, funding source that was geared for behavioral health with African American. There is a disparity in the number of black people that follow up after an emergency room visit than there is white people. And so the Michigan Health Endowment Fund wanted to discover what was the barrier, what was the problem. And so they tasked me and our agency to take the lead role in that. We actually discovered several things. There is um, stigma, institutionalized and um, systemic racism um, that, that exists that in the black community they feel that is a barrier. Other barriers were the type of med medical insurance that they had, that when they showed up at the emergency room, whether they had Medicaid or private insurance made a difference in how they were treated. And then the other barriers that we really discovered was when they got into these places, especially in follow-up care, there wasn't very many people that looked like them that they could follow up with. And so those are some of the, the discoveries that we discovered um, as a result of that racial disparities grant. They also um, tasked me with doing the implementation of the discovery grant. So in the next two years, we will be implementing some of the recommendations that I had for the Michigan Health Endowment Fund by doing miniature breaking the stigmas all over this community with five different churches. The churches came out in large droves in responding to breaking the stigma. And because they have the greatest impact in the black community, we wanted to build black churches to be able to educate the black community. And so we'll also be doing um, other things, an anti-stigma campaign that we'll be doing for a whole year that you'll see different things to help to change the perception in the black community that mental health, they need mental health services and that it's good for them. And so we'll be doing some follow up with that. One thing I want to leave, and I often have this conversation with myself and with others about um, inequality, equality, equity, and justice. And since we're talking about Martin Luther King and his dream, you know, was e that all men were created equal, right? That's what it says um, even in the, um, the United States, um, our documents, that we were all created equal. That's what it said. That's not been the experience of the black community. And so when we look at inequity, and I thought this was a great um, graphic, um, if you can look at this tree, you'll see that the tree is bent in a certain direction. And there's one person on the side of the tree, and all the apples can easily fall because the tree is bent in that direction where the other person on the other side of the tree is just trying to get some apples to fall, but there's a bend in the tree, so the tree is going in the other direction. So inequity, I mean, in, um, equality means that we're not getting equal access. We're not getting the same things. And then we say, oh my gosh, we need to have equality. Yes, equality. And we're like, yes, equality. And I'm like, no, equality, okay. So we still have that tree. And you can see equality is, well, let's give everybody equal everything. You know, you get a ladder, you get a ladder, you get a ladder. We all get a ladder. Well, yeah, do we all need a ladder? If the tree is already bent in your favor and you're already getting all the fruit from the tree, do you still need a ladder to get even more fruit? And do you see the other side? I still, even though you gave me a taller ladder, I still cannot reach the fruit in the tree. So that's what equality looks like. Oh, so you know what? We're gonna go to equity. We're gonna, we're gonna fix this up and we're gonna go to equity. And that's the terminology, equity, equity, equity. Oh, equity. <sighs> I don't know if equity is equity. So I was like, if I get the opportunity, so I'm taking this opportunity to say, I don't, I don't necessarily know that I believe in equity. And this is, this is my, my premise here. So we look at equity, and equity says we give people what they need to really uh, do what needs to be done. So even though you have a ladder and I have a ladder, maybe your ladder needs to be a little bit taller so that you can really, now we can have equity because now you have exactly what you need. But you see that bend in the tree, right? That tree is still bent. That, that bent tree is really bothering me. Because that bent tree says, now that even though I have equity, I have, a, I have more tools to get to what I need, that tree is still bent. And it doesn't matter how much equity you give to me. 
doesn't matter how tall the ladder you give to me, if the bend in the tree is still there, I'm still not getting what the other person on the other side of that tree is getting. So we look at justice. So we look at this bend in the tree, and the bend in the tree is the systems. It's the systems that have been developed, and the systems that have been de developed have not been systems in favor of me. And the systems that have been developed have not been in favor of people that look like me. And so here we have systems, we say uh, uh, institutional inequities. I think that's what it's called. It's, right, it's another terminology for racism. And so if we don't collectively, and this is really what I thought Martin Luther King was getting at, if we don't collectively come together as blacks, whites, and browns and work on redefining what our systems look like, then we never really get to equity because the system is still bent in the favor of someone else. So let's get to justice. One last thing Martin Luther King said, I think this was at the very end of his quote on I Have a Dream. It says, no, we are not satisfied and will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, well, I see you got that position now, I'm sorry. That's okay. Are you guys, is your program limited to cover common people now so that more people can use the support being able to reach out to you? I'm saying, are you, are you limited by the resources, support that you receive from other people that you are doing? We can receive more. We are not uh, at capacity. So we definitely could receive more uh, referrals. We can definitely serve more people. Absolutely. So thank you for that question. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. School pilot program? So she was asking about our pilot program with Millwood Middle School. That is specifically for Millwood Middle School students currently because it's a pilot. And the way, if you have a student at Millwood Middle School that is struggling with suspensions, because what was provided, the data that was provided was there's 53 students that are suspended um, more than three to 10 days a year. If we narrow that down, 29 of those students are suspended more than 10 days a year. When you put those collective numbers together, you have over 829 days of out of school time for 29 kids. That is over three years of out of school time. That's huge. How can we expect our kids to succeed if they're out of school that often? And so this particular pilot program is specifically for Millwood currently because we got to pilot it because we're talking about um, the most at risk students and how do we help them get recentered so that they can get refocused and education becomes a priority. So you would have to talk to the principal. And this is not a KPS thing. This is a, a, a parent, if your parent wants to take advantage of this opportunity, they can do it, okay? Any other questions? Chet. Oh, wow. Yeah, that does work. <laughs> um, so when you're working with kids, um, there's always the other half of that equation, mm -hmm. the adults. So you can work with kids. What, what are the barriers for the adults to help the kids the best? Because you got to do work on both ends. Mm -hmm. so what, 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 what areas have you targeted that the adults who are handling the kids need to work on? That's a good question. So when we think about, um, we've changed, uh, COVID has caused us to change our approach to how we try to get kids to come to our program. So I'm going to talk about our programs and then I'm going to talk about the school. 
in the programs, we would say, hey, we got all of this stuff over here to offer you, and we would get no kids to show up. So we started to recruit the kids, and we recruited them. We interviewed them. They have to sign up because that's why we incentivize. And then a part of that is the parents have to come to a parent meeting. The parents have to come to parent boot camp. We have a boot camp for the parents that they have to come, and the kids are teaching them. So we started from the beginning where the parents have to be intricately involved. And we, in our Mind Health Ambassadors program, we require all of the students to take therapy the entire <laughs> the entire time they're in the program. So it is a program requirement to have therapy. The first time we did it, they only had to go to three sessions, and they were like, oh, I did my three sessions, I'm done. All of our kids, a lot of our kids, adolescents, they, need, they have mental health issues all over the place. And so one of the things we've done is we got parent consent, parent buy-in, parent sign. So that's in our other programs. At the school, what we're trying to do right now, because we're really trying to push this forward, is we're trying to have a parent meeting with those parents whose students are most affected by these situations that I, I shared and getting the parent to buy in and to communicate. One of the things that we would like to do is to have um, an academic liaison who really works with the schools and the parents so that we can stay focused on some of the things that we're doing. So those are some of the things. And the parents, because they commit at the beginning and we've gone over and reviewed the requirements, then they're kind of obligated because they signed off on stuff and we remind them, we call them. We're intentional about staying connected with them and saying this is um, what the program requires for your child to succeed. Hopefully that helps. Okay. Sierra? Okay. What she said was, what was, in my growing up years, was there something that happened that made me feel called to um, go into this field? I wouldn't say that specifically. Now, don't laugh at my rationale. I always have to put my head down. My initial rationale was, I want a job that I can have my summers off. I'm going to go into social work and be a school social worker because they get the summers off. My initial rationale, that was young thinking. And then as um, I grew up in the church, you know, I've grown up in the church, um, and I became, um, we started, actually started our ministry while I was working on my master's program. And I felt like there was the stigma that was attached to getting mental health. And so I wanted to be an advocate within to help to break that. Um, one of the um, speakers that I've had for our Breaking the Stigma said, you can have Jesus and a counselor too. And so I wanted, I wanted I wanted the black community to know way back then, 20 years ago, that they, they were not considered weak and they were not considered without faith if they got the mental health support that they really needed. So that was kind of my driving force. Thank you. So she asked me, do I have any Latinas or Latinos in the program and do I have any bilingual um, staff? We do have Latinas in the program. We've had them in all of the programs coming through. We do not have like, um, Spanish-speaking staff. And that is something that we have had. OK, well, talk to me afterwards. That's something that we have had. And let me tell you one of the challenges. It's hard to keep Spanish-speaking staff because if you're a nonprofit organization and you're smaller and you only can pay so much, the bigger organizations come and swallow you up by taking you, I mean, <laughs> they take your staff. Um, and so those are some of the challenges, but we definitely are always looking for the full-blown diversity. Even though you hear me passionate about black people, I'm passionate about all people, but I'm most passionate because it's the people that, I, that look like me that I wanna see have a better quality of life. So thank you, and please see me afterwards. Okay, thank you.
Uh, thank all of you for being here. First of all, we want to honor Western's medical program, Dr. Dixon, for allowing us this space and this opportunity to celebrate with Dr. King's dream of everybody being able to live out their dreams. I want to thank every one of you here for taking your valuable time and bringing your presence and your energy, your persona, your moxie, your character to this. It's going to take all of us. I want to thank uh, Miss Ward. I'm pretty sure someone knows your mom and dad, and they're going to hear the incredible child they raised. <laughs> CEO Cunningham, where did she go? Right in front of me. You're going to be blessed in so many ways. If I may give you a word of encouragement, stop apologizing for doing what's right. There is nothing fair about this life that we live. Some have not gotten the breaks. Somebody has to champion for those who don't have the voice for themselves. Somebody has to be strong enough to stand in the storm and stand in the gap and intercede on the behalf. You know what I'm saying because you speak the same language I speak. Dr. King dared to dream, but I believe Dr. King didn't only dream, he understood. One of the most horrible conditions a person can find himself in when you dream in here, but you live here. He began to accelerate the process. And it cost him everything eventually. But aren't we so glad that he did it? You all stand here with that similar spirit. We have meant a purpose. My brother and I, we came together in uh, the early 90s. We lived in a... Uh, neighborhood where there were plenty of little boys and no fathers. He would take his son to the park and I was taking my two sons to the park and there was 20, 25 other little boys who didn't have a dad. We began mentoring them at that time. Accelerate 10, 12 years, we began to uh, partner with the YMCA. I love the YMCA. They gave us a space, a safe place to receive young people. We both worked for Kalamazoo Public Schools. We both saw a need that these young men had to show somebody to teach them how to be the best version of themselves. We don't speak English because we stand on American soil. You speak English because the people in your house speak that. You got to have somebody modeling for you how to be you. But when some of us come from environments when we're in survival mode all the time, we in distress all the time, it's hard to excel when you play in defense. To that end, we started Men of Purpose in uh, 2018. My brother, if you would like to continue on in discussing how we got to this point. Absolutely. So 2018 was the first call for Men of Purpose, and it started with just a, a social media post. Uh, like he said, we've been mentoring for 30 plus years, right? But come 2018, about 30 to 50 men showed up to a meeting to do the work, right? Because everybody understands it. We know what the needs are. Now who's gonna roll up their sleeves and actually get it done? So we started at Cookies on the North Side, right? We start putting our educational background. He's got a master's, I got a master's. When I moved back to Canada, from Canada in 2015, first conversation was, are you doing okay? Yes, now let's get to work, was the next question. What are we gonna do next? That came the call for Men of Purpose. We didn't even have a name at that point. We just always believe in being a part of the solution versus a part of the problem. We don't live in that space where we're all uh, so downtrodden that we can't do something about it. I understand what my strengths are. This is my kindred spirit, so we rolled up our sleeves. And like I said, we continue to meet. The people who ended up staying after 30 to 50 people showed up, are the men you see on this board right here. So it's me and Tony. I got my brother Trevon Grace, who was in his early 30s. We've been mentoring him back at the YMCA since we did teen late night basketball. He's stuck with us all that time. He's our board president. So we understand how these things work. We're not gonna be here forever. So we're recruiting our replacements now. We're grooming them now. And even he has 18 year olds and 15 year olds that he's grooming. So this system is gonna be self-perpetuating. That's the goal. Brother Curtis Woods, our event coordinator, and I just want to honor these men because a lot of time I don't get this opportunity 
to say these are the men who are helping doing this work. Uh, accomplished chefs and tradesmen, Nick Boyd is our lead economic strategist. Tony Whitelow was a senior in high school at KPS when I came back. That was the first job that I took uh, when I came back to Kalamazoo. Uh, now he's the newest father. Is he the newest? Yep, mm -hmm. he just had a baby. So congratulations to him. Uh, DeMargio White, accomplished chef for Huey D's Goodies, Ramon Harbin, and I don't think he made the slide, Mr. Orlando Little is our uh, lead tradesman. So these are the men who showed up event, uh, initially. This is one of our first pictures at our first brunches. This work is continuing to grow. We got a lot of collaborators in the community um, and we're just energized. I, I feel like I'm being called off the bench in the fourth quarter to guard Steph Curry. See, I'm a defensive specialist. Not real good at basketball, but I can stop somebody, right? Damn. So, so these are uh, members of our board right here, and we just continue to be consistent to do this work. We're happy that W. Mad the Striker School, Dr. Dickinson, uh, Miss Tanya has uh, invited yes. us here uh, for a little honor. Uh, but you know, we're just here to share our experiences. Um, this is our orator, so I'll let him carry that forward a little bit. While we started Men of Purpose. All right. Again. We, uh, we saw the need. I could go into you with the history of how we got to this place. The beautiful thing I love about our country, both my brother and I are military veterans. We believe in the values of this country. The concepts that our forefathers created, in theory, are beautiful. It's the best in the world. The execution hasn't been equal for everyone. We come from a culture and environment where fair ain't fair. As Ms. Cunningham so accurately put, when you got to reach up all the time, we get all these catchphrases, equal, equitable, and all of that, until there's justice, until everybody has the same opportunity to advance in their dreams, until everybody has the same, a similar opportunity, a chance to reach their personal goals, that we still got work to do. We poured into, we poured into, we poured into, other programs, other organizations, and we're so grateful. We work with so many organizations here in this city. However, people weren't personally invested. They didn't have skin in the game. So when things didn't go the way they, they thought they should go, when one of the children uh, showed uh, behavior, then the programs would get shut down. We learn to look at the individual, not their behavior. I'm an educator by trade. Kalamazoo Public Schools, uh, 34, this is year 34 for me. I was blessed to be raised by a woman who taught me to look at the person, not the behavior. We see who they're going to become, not some of the things they're going through. I've never met a bad child in my life. I've met some children in some horrendous situations, and so they respond according to what they've been given. However, all of our experience teaches us when you embrace a child, when you model for them success, when you teach them discipline, when you show them the right way to do it, they respond in kind. Our children are the heroes. I'm going to go into this further in a moment. They really are. They go through so many egregious situations, so many things that they didn't cause. And we ask them to get over it. As Ms. Cunningham said, just pull yourself up. It sounds good. But most of us in the room ain't had to pull ourselves up the way many of these kids do every day. And then we take it for granted. Oh, just get over. You ain't got your household intact. Get over. Your mother either working four or five jobs trying to do it by herself. Get over. You ain't never met your father. Get over. You dealing with systemic poverty. We are men of purpose. We unapologetically are designed to help young black men. However, not only is it in our uh, bylaws, it's in our DNA. We help children from 8 to 80. We help children who identify themselves as something other than what we do. We, I, we help I work with children who may not have the same racial uh, com, uh, component as we do. We don't turn anybody down because everybody can use some support. If you're struggling, if you don't have enough, it's like walking through life on a tightrope without a safety net. Some of our contemporaries, they got mom, dad, grandmothers, they have generations 
of building up successful strategies to be successful in our community. Generations of building up wealth, they pass along to their children and their children's and their children's children. Why some of us are just being fight, fighting for the last 400 plus years to be treated as equal. Women weren't even allowed to vote to less than 150, maybe less than 150, what, uh, 1920 maybe? Minorities weren't uh, being allowed to be uh, voting right uh, 150 years. So even though we all here, we all had to have different challenges. And until somebody honest and brave enough to say that, we ain't talking about fair. We talking about justice. That's what we attempt to do here at Men of Purpose. We here celebrating Dr. Martin Luther King, celebrating what his legacy and what it meant. Every one of you embody that legacy. I will give it to you in simple terms that I can. Most people operate in their feelings, which is an immature way of doing things. Mature people operate in facts. The fact is, people of color are disproportionately disadvantaged than uh, their Caucasian contemporaries. That's just a fact. Some of us have enough wisdom and experience to operate in faith. Dr. King knew if we all come together and have faith in one another, have faith in humanity, have faith in our fellow man, we can all get this turned around for the better for people. That's how we started. So our methods are simple. We reserve the right to define ourselves. That was something we knew had to be a cornerstone and that we discussed as our mantra. There are lots of messages out in in the, in the media, in the world that will try to define you and tell you who you are, you don't get to do that. And for every child we come in contact with, we protect that. We protect their right to choose who they are because we see a lot of discouragement. I was in a position in the public schools 15 years ago, gathering the data. Who's getting sent out of class? Who's getting suspended? Those kids look very familiar and it was the same kids over and over. So out of 400 students who came into my office, it was my job to be the referee between school staff, children, and families. It was the same kids. Now, I'm no rocket scientist. I can kind of predict if he ain't never in class, if she ain't never in class, by the time graduation get here, hmm. they're going to be ill-prepared. Unfortunately, some of those kids have passed away from gun violence. Some of those kids are at the corner stores asking for a dollar. And it was all predictable, right? So when you have a, an opportunity to pour into a kid, regardless what they look like, if they come to you with a need, I have a 36-year-old white son, Chris. <laughs> when he was 18, 19 years old in foster care, our teen late night basketball was the safe haven for him to come and get away, let loose, meet some people who didn't care that he was in foster care or that he didn't have the nicest shoes. We poured into him. He came and told me, well, he told us. When he got out of foster care, they kicked him out. They stopped getting paid. He didn't have anywhere to stay. I don't know about you, but I'm not going to turn that kid away. And I didn't. So he slept on the couch in the dorms where I was staying as a grad student until he could help figure it out. You need $10 for the day? Here you go. We started removing barriers from kids' lives 20 plus years ago, and we're gonna continue with that mission. And we believe every day holds a teachable moment. So we're very relationship uh, oriented. We gotta spend time with a kid. They don't care what you gonna tell them to do unless they know you care about them. So we invest heavy upfront in those relationships. We create opportunities and any day is a day that we can figure it out. It's a pretty smart guy. It's a lot of smart people in this room. So we harness this energy so we can all collectively figure it out for our kids. We're just a conduit. If you ever wanted to figure out, man, how can I go volunteer and spend some time to pour into kids? I guarantee you, we can figure out an opportunity for you. We don't approach things from a negative uh, uh, doom and gloom perspective. We believe every problem has a solution. I'm undaunted. When I know what the mission is, I don't care what you say. Hmm. I'm gonna go forward. Either I can go through you, around you, whatever it is, whatever's going to be most equitable for everybody. But when there's a solution to be had and I'm committed to it, I'm undaunted. That's just how God has built me. 
I'm not sure about everybody else, but that's, that's just me. So that's our mission. We are always looking how to solve uh, problems for our kids, to build them up and make sure that they get from boyhood to manhood without all the pitfalls that are out there. And there's a lot of them. So we, we want to champion that cause, and, and that's just what we do organically on a daily basis. You want to speak to the supporters? Yes. We are uh, successful this young people's and what men of purpose do did not come. Nobody's an island. When people say self-made, I'm self-made. That's, that's just that's an oxymoron. You didn't fall out your mother's womb and just take off and start doing what you do. <laughs> Everybody in this room had somebody. For me, myself, if I may share a brief description with you, my story is, uh, it is what it is. My mother spent nine of my first 18 years in and out of prison. 13 felonies she accumulated. Never met my father, didn't know his name till I was almost 40. It's not a sad story whatsoever. My life has been exceptional, incredible. Didn't take a bunch of people in my life, just one or two good ones. My grandmother, I was blessed to have her raise me. And if I would have had my mother and my father, then I wouldn't have had this incredible woman. So I thank God for that. It worked out the way. It didn't look conventional. A lot of our children are raised up in a uh, situation, circumstances not conventional. And yet we ask them to overcome challenges. We ask them to walk off gunshot wounds with a Band-Aid. They need our support. They need us to believe in them. My grandmother, uh, I was her favorite person, and she didn't make any qualms about it. She let everybody know. She loved me enough. Uh, Ms. Cunningham talked about being disciplined. Some people call it spanking. Some, I got whoopings. <laughs> I thank my mother and my grandmother for every time they love me enough. Because that's what you got to do sometimes. You got to love somebody enough to teach them what's right from wrong. You can't conduct yourself any kind of way and think it's going to work out. And so my grandmother, one time I wrote on the wall with crayons. She got into me like she didn't know me. And I realized, oh, so that's the line, Grandma, I can't cross with you. Got it. Won't be writing on the walls anymore, crayons. <laughs> okay. Uh, however... In that same vein, our young men, they want to be corrected. They want somebody to love them enough to teach them the right way to do things. Now, the method in which happens, I got two sons. My oldest boy, Junior, he's my namesake, and he's like his daddy. You tell him don't cross the line, Junior's a perpetual line crosser. He's going to take one more step. My youngest boy, I can tell him I'm disappointed with you, and he'll break down, and he'll do whatever he needs to do. So everybody's different. My brother and I, we've learned over the years to put a lot of different tools in our tool belts because every child's going to need something different. Every child's going to react different. And the only way we can learn this is have relationships with them. They're the heroes. We're just doing our part what we've been blessed to do. I had so many people poured into me uh, as a man. Our mothers do a terrific job of trying to be the mother and the father. But on mama's best day, she's never been a man. She's never been a black man in a society that sometimes look at us different than they do everybody else. And so we have to start facilitating and, and, and setting those uh, fundamental blocks to be successful. We have to teach them how to interact with other people. We have to teach them conflict resolution skills. It's okay to be upset. It's not okay to hurt other people because you're upset. You have to be well-educated because I don't care what... A uh, form you go into profession, if you can't read, if you're not literate, you're not going to be able to understand what they're asking of you. Math is everything of everything that we do. I don't care what you're in. Math is how we put people in the space. Math is those tables you're sitting at. Math is the color of your eyes, those 23 chromosomes you get from your mother and father. So we have to teach them to be proficient mathematically. And school has got to be for them like it's for everybody else. They're not at school because it's a social gathering or because they, we told them to go to school. They have to be well-educated so they can go out. And what Dr. King talked about, dreams, they can begin to make their dreams come true so they're not just wishing. I tell people it's a horrible place to wish. You want to be able to put together a comprehensive strategy to have a goal and a plan and then put uh, objectives in place that you can make your dreams come true. And we do that for them. And so in that vein, we can't do this by ourselves. These are a few of the organizations. The beautiful thing I love about Kalamazoo, and I'm a native Kalamazoo, there is no shortage of those who are willing to stand in the gap. 
a uh, few years back, we asked the public safety to uh, help us out. They opened up their facility and uh, Officer Glenn became Chef Glenn and they threw down and they cooked for our children. We have to get our children to understand the public safety is the heroes. They're the ones that show up when everybody else is running out. But they got to see it and hear it from us. Uh, I'm going to turn this over to my brother, Miss Cunningham. We really could have just sat down and let you, because everything you said was head on. Children have to see people who look like them. And, and your slides were much nicer. We're going to have to collaborate on that. Yeah, yeah. we was going to talk about that later. Yeah, we was going to nice. talk about like We was right here. Yeah. But when she discussed, children have to see somebody like look like them in positions of leadership. Everybody, human beings, we desire what we see. Unfortunately, too many of our boys in our neighborhoods, they admire the athletes, the entertainers, or unfortunately, the drug dealers. I tell our young boys, you can do more than rap, crack, or play ball. Mm. Right but we have to model for them. They have to see somebody. They can't see he and I in destitution and talk about I want to aspire to be like them. They can't see he and I laying up on our mama's couch in our 40s and 50s and aspire to be like that. They have to have somebody that looks like them, who's going through what they go through, who can tell them, I never met my father. I made it, you gonna make it. My mother got more felonies than you got fingers on your hand. I made it, you gonna make it. I don't care how I feel. The fact is, I need to be successful. And I have faith if I work hard, there's going to be some people that's going to be put in my life that's going to help me. It may not be traditional. Every teacher I had in school encouraged me to be successful. Everybody doesn't have that same testimony. I was fortunate. My educators all believed in me. I had uncles. They were alcoholics and drugs, drug addicts and drunks. But they, they, they looked at me and through their mistakes, they told me, don't be like this. You got people in your lives that will help you. And we have to get our children to understand that when we started Mental Purpose, we had a vision. We didn't know how we was going to make it work. But we dared to speak it. And we spoke it. You can believe it. And if you can believe it, you can achieve it. And then everybody started pouring in. All these organizations you see up here reached out to us. I don't think we have uh, Kalamazoo Valley Community College, uh, Western. My goodness, just even organizations, Medical Striker Center. Medical Center. I mean, we uh we took our boys to uh Gretchen Whitner, her secretary, saw what we were doing one summer. She asked us, what can we do for y'all? We said we want to come up there and teach them about government. They got to be involved in the system of government. Every year we take our boys up there, and every year they point to them. I'm telling you, these young men, I know y'all see them in a certain way. When they get the opportunity, they excel just like everybody else. Unfortunately, boys were born and raised in Kalamazoo, Michigan. We drove by the library, and they never seen the downtown library before. At 16. High school. So we got all these organizations pouring in. Uh, Kalamazoo local government, uh, the Kalamazoo County Commission, Julie Rogers, Fred Upton. My brother was being polite when he say this. We don't ask, we expect to get what we need to do what we need to do. These are the organizations who have helped us. One last thing we want to talk about, who we serve. My brother and I are both going to uh, share this. Uh, all of you come here, all of you, you are to be commended. You took time in your day to pour into somebody who's not your child. And that's what human beings we have to do. Most people, we live in a country right now, we going through it, we have excess, we have more than anybody else. And yet we always so upset, we always so frustrated, we always complaining. You have to come outside of your own personal circle, your comfort zone, and see that there's a whole other beautiful world going on. These young people we serve, they the heroes. When he talked about our, our boy Chris, or our man Chris, Chris will be 37 next month. Chris was in foster care his whole life. The day he turned 18 in February, they didn't get a check for him anymore. They put him out. We met him. He was on the side of a garbage can. Took him in, loved up on him to this day, in relationship with him. That's what some of our young people go through. 
I don't have to dream about the effect. My sister had kids at an early age. She had a nervous breakdown, mental health, and our community thinking, oh, I got to be strong, I got to be strong. How are you going to be strong? You started having kids at 16. Your mother was supposed to show you how to be a mom. She's not in your life. Your dad not in your life. So one day my, my 11, 12, and 13-year-old nieces and nephews came home from school and their mama gone and didn't tell anybody. Now they sleeping on porches and they too ashamed to call their uncle so I can come get them. So I don't have to think about the, the ill effects of what happens to some of our families. I done lived it. However, I reached out to Kalamazoo Public School, uh, uh, Keisha Hemp here. I said, I need some help. My nieces and nephews, we need some help. She said, take this number. If they don't help you, call me back. So many times, Mark Hill, my nephew, was ready to graduate, but he's sleeping with whoever let him leave on his couch. He took something that didn't belong to him. The principal at Phoenix, he didn't discard him, but he did hold him accountable. You took this phone. We're going to find a way for you to pay for this phone, but you're going to graduate. Somebody had to step in. Somebody had to look past what he was doing and look at him. He going to make it. Not as this strong man raising his son, even though he never had a father. Men of purpose, we don't look at what they're going through. We look at them. They're the future of our society. They're a reflection of us. I'm going to pass this off to my brother. I'm a teacher by trade. If not every day, every week, I tell my third grade students. We not staying in this world. Everybody leaving here. You're going to be judged by what you do for other people. Don't nobody care if you got rich and famous, if you didn't help somebody else. Don't nobody care about how much laughing and joking and how much good times you had if, if you didn't support somebody else when they was going through it. Your final essay, your exam, the type of person you was in this world is what you do for other people and not your family, not your inner circles, not the people you feel obligated to, but those who you didn't know, those who need it the most. I thank you all. I'm going to send this over to my brother. And I thank Dr. King for setting an example. I tell people all the time, if he's not one of the five greatest Americans, I don't know who is. So in conclusion, that's, that's what we do. Who we serve, the data suggests we need to be serving young males of color, indigenous, black males specifically. I'm like Mother Cunningham. I, I'm not making any apologies in my oh. 50. I'm pretty bold with it, right? That's my superpower. I've learned what that is, and, I, and I'm pretty rugged when it comes to accomplishing goals, and, and those are who we uh, serve in our community. It's best served in fostering a positive self-identity. I can't listen to another young black boy tell me his only options to being a provider for his family is an NBA player or a rapper. You can do so much more than that, and that's part of our daily mission. And like I said, in conclusion, we're creating a self-perpetual system. So we're raising up the next generation of mentors. Uh, this mission is not going to stop, uh, and the work goes on. We didn't put our contact information on the uh, slides, but we have plenty of business cards. If you want to get in contact with us, feel free. Thank you. Thank you. We're honored. Thank you. you got a question. Similar to what Ms. Cunningham was saying, we are well-educated, and we believe in being well-educated. However, everyone's not for a college-going culture. We have a, one of our, a part of our organization. We do uh, comprehensive training. We, we teach them uh, job training skills. Uh, we make it uh, amicable for them to uh, receive training because a person got to be able to sustain their own economic growth. Mm -hmm. They got to do something to generate their own success. You can't live off somebody else and call yourself an adult. 
So we definitely have different avenues of uh, creating them positions mm -hmm. where they can become self-sustaining economically. First thing we do is a skill assessment and interest assessment so we can kind of guide their path. And then we go look for those people to connect them with. There's a good group of tradesmen. There's a, a group of people who want to be educators. Some want to be plumbers all over the gamut. So, yes, we're open to collaborating. A doctor is going to be connected here. So, yes, uh, contact us and we can we can bridge that gap. I think you had a question here in the front. We're in conversation with them right now. They reached out to us. Yeah, that they're, they're struggling in the, the male department, but on both ends, like the, with elementary students. I hear a lot of elementary students that are of color saying that they feel like the women don't give them out. Mm -hmm. But I also hear men's staff um, working for KPSN, even as a parent, saying, well, sometimes they're having conflict with women's staff how about that? So they need to expand the, the, the staff that can accommodate the needs in the public schools. We're all over that. And I will tell you, if you're concerned about that, we are in conversation with them about that now. Reach out to them and tell them. Tell them to accelerate this. Uh, I'm an educator, and if I may say this quickly, there's only one profession I admire more than teachers, and that's public safety officers. 65% of teachers are Caucasian women. That's not the demographic that they serve, but however, they're the ones that show up every day. So yes, there's gonna be some conflict because it's hard to understand the culture that you don't come from. So that's not their fault. However, we do have to work in KPS is trying, but we have to make it equitable for people to be in these positions. I'm an educator. Most of my peers say, why are you going in the school system when you can make a lot more money something else? Because mm -hmm. this is what I was designed to do. But everybody don't think that way. So we have to make it make sense. Uh, I want to say Ms. Cunningham talked about keeping the talent. That's one of the huge things, men of purpose. I can't tell somebody to pour their life into somebody else's children and then make peanuts and not have enough. Mm -hmm. So we got to make it make sense. But no, we're working with them right now on that. Any other questions? <laughs> So what we want to do, thank you all for staying uh, a little longer, but this is the time we want to actually present the awards uh, for their excellence in uh, exemplifying uh, the principles and the standards of what Martin Luther King um, stood for and what their organizations are doing here in Kalamazoo. I also want to say that Bronson uh, Systems Hospital is actually our partner for this event. And I see Terry Morrow, Vice President. Um, if you can stand up, Terry, we want to thank you for partnering with us. Thank you very much for partnering with us for this event. And so I'd like to give the award now. And if you want to come up too, Terry, you can come up too. I want to give the award, we want to give the award to Men of Purpose. And it is for demonstrating service and outstanding contributions to providing mentoring services to youth in the community. W. Med Martin Luther King Day 2023. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Our second award is to um, Valerie Cunningham for Synergy Health Center for demonstrating service and outstanding contributions for mental health awareness and service to the black community. W. Med Martin Luther King Day 2023. We have now, I'd like to introduce um,
Sorry. Um, we also have an honorarium for um, both of our organizations. Um, we're pleased to give them each $500. We know it's not a lot, but it's something that contributes, hopefully, to the work that you're doing. And we just have a video montage that I'd like to have introduced for, about the Helen Fox Gospel Music Center. And the uh, presenter for um, the montage is um, Joseph Fox. Thank you. Okay. All right. Go ahead. <laughs> Very good. Thank you for uh, sticking around. I'm Joseph Fox, and I'm here to talk about the Helen Fox Gospel Music Center. I want to give you just a few remarks on the history. Um, actually, the, the center was named after my mother, who was Helen Fox, who was a worked in the community. Uh, she believed very much in education. When she was 50, she graduated from uh, adult education and got her high school degree. And then to set an example for her family, she went on to WMU to uh, get like, I think it was associates of a, equivalent to a uh, associates in music, because she felt that if she was to be, if she was to be credible, that she should have the education. So she, she was an example. Kids used to come to her house and she would give them music lessons um, or she would go to their homes. And then eventually she went in partnership with another gentleman, Ruben Moss, and became, uh, they started a music studio. So eventually she transitions out of that and didn't do music for a number of years. But that's something that I saw uh, as an example that she did. So in 2016, actually in 2012, we, the other co-founder, who is Bridget Tucker Gonder, we started talking about forming a music center. And we were both working in corporate, so we just we could only do it hit and miss and like form the uh, the license and register it and get a P.O. box and things like that. So in 2016, which is actually the same year my mother died, we launched the Helen L. Fox Gospel Music Center and we're located in the Douglas Community Association. And our focus was really to be aware where the target audience are located, make it easier because transportation is sometimes a difficult thing. So some things that um, she focused on, um, well, well, let me tell you what we teach. We teach piano, violin, viola, cello, and voice. And we have five teachers. We started with two teachers on four students. Now we average about 35 students per semester per term. Um, things that we provide, um, we provide formal and informal music instruction. We provide scholarships because our target market doesn't have a lot of resources, so we want to help them. Uh, we also provide a place for them to actually practice. And also we want to... Uh, we actually rent music, uh, not music, but uh, musical instruments, because a lot of kids don't have that, that resource. So what uh, we tried to do, because we feel that music is very important, and so what we're doing is because research has shown that uh, music really does help in a lot of other areas of a child's life, helps with math skills and things like that. So. In lieu of students, because they're in school today, uh, we actually produced a little video so you could see the type of things that we're doing. So I want you to take a quick look at that before you take off for the day. So thanks for listening.
And nine years old, I'm gonna play a song for you, Mom. What's it called? It's called Tinkle Twinkle Little Star. What variation? Pepperoni Pizza. Ready? <laughs> One, two, ready, go. <laughs> Thank you. 
This is the end of our program, but before we close, I do want to bring up one of our medical students, our second year, Bree Ivey, who's in uh, the, one of the leaders, co-leaders of our organization, Student National Medical Association, to so just say a few words about what we're doing with that organization. Bree. Thank you, Dr. Dixon. Um, hello, everyone. Like Dr. Dixon said, I'm a second year medical student. I'm the president of uh, WMED's chapter of SNM SNMA. Um, it is the Student National Medical Association. Um, and just to give you an idea of what the Student National Medical Association is about, I'm going to read to you what the mission is so I don't botch it. Um, so it's the goal is diversifying the face of medicine and then this organization has existed since 1964, and um, SNMA is committed to supporting current and future underrepresented minority medical students, addressing the needs of underserved communities, and increasing the number of clinically excellent, culturally competent, and socially conscious physicians. Um, SNMA chapters based at allopathic and osteopathic medical schools throughout the nation and some colleges implement our programs and activities locally. SNMA programs are designed to serve the health needs of underserved communities and communities of color. In addition, SNMA is dedicated both to ensuring that medical education and services are culturally sensitive to the needs of diverse populations and to increasing the number of African American, Latino, and other students of color entering and completing medical school. So um, at its inception, SNMA was an offshoot of the National Medical Association, which was an association by and for black physicians. Eventually, SNMA realized the goals of NMA was to support physicians, and in order to do what they could to support students, they eventually became an independent organization in 1971. Um, and since then, they have ex had the goal of increasing numbers of minority students um, because uh, only 5% of practicing physicians are African American where the national population is about 14%, which is a huge discrepancy. And to echo what um, all of the presenters who came before me said, you can't be what you can't see, right? So um, that's the goal uh, of SNMA. And as, as it evolved over the past few decades, it spread from just, you know, supporting medical students to trying to increase the numbers to starting to teach cultural competency and then also expanding to serve their the communities that they work in and around. Um, and in that same breath, the with the, uh, the with serving those communities, they also wanted to expand the horizons of the communities they serve to know and see that, okay, this is something that I can do as well. Um, so here at WMED, um, I'm the president. I'm also a new mom with a five-month-old and a second-year medical student, and <laughs> we're trying to do a lot, and thankfully, we're able to kind of expand our leadership because it was just two of us prior to this month who are trying to run the entire organization. We have a bigger leadership board now, and we're expanding to help support MAPS, which is the Minorities Association for Pre-Medical Students, which is um, the undergraduate organization that SNMA chapters are meant to sponsor and support and help. And so we are reestablishing the connections with the organizations on WMU's campus and K College. We're also expanding to increase our mentorship um, within undergraduates and throughout the com community. We have a couple events this uh, on campus um, next week and we'll have um, we have a whole slew of events for Black History Month um, and I'm working really hard to get more events and more people exposed, more children, adolescents, uh, pre-meds, young adults exposed to STEM, exposed to the fields of scientific research so we can help improve the numbers so people of color we all we get better care when we can work with people who look like us and when the doctors know where we're coming from um, and we can relate to them on that level so we're we're working really hard here and on a national level to accomplish these goals and there's a lot that I'm trying to accomplish this year and I hope uh, for some of the events that they will be seen, and we'll, I do want to try to start partnering with more organizations throughout Kalamazoo, so I definitely will be in touch with Dr. Cunningham and um, 
um, Mr. Spencer and Mr. Atkinson so we can get some things done. Um, that's all. Thank you. So that is the end of our program today. We want to thank everyone for, from, for coming out. We want to thank all of our presenters, Men of Purpose, um, the Health, the Synergy Health Center, um, the Helen Fox Gospel Music School, um, Sierra Ward. And um, we want to thank Bronson for, for partnering with us. And feel free to get some more of the lunch that we have back there. Those were actually both things. The lunch was catered by... Um, Davis Delectables and the dessert by Huey D Goodies, which are two black owned catering companies in town. So enjoy and thank you for coming. Hope to see you next year.